someone's hand right around you, step across the aisle and shake a hand and tell them that you're glad that they're in the house of the Lord tonight. just invite the presence of the Lord to come into the house tonight in a special way. Lord, we just love you and we praise your holy name and you are awesome, Lord, to us. Lord, we thank you for your, your spirit. We thank you for your love and your grace, Lord, and we just want to give you praise tonight as we uh, sing to you and we hear the word of God. As I come into your presence past the gates of praise to your sanctuary till we're standing face to face I can only look upon your countenance I see the fullness of your grace and I can only bow down and I'll say you are awesome in this place mighty God Come on, sing with me. You are awesome in this place. I'm a father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place. Mighty God. Oh, you are awesome.
surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the breath of angels wings. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight for our midweek service here at Stony Run and uh, for Bible study. Uh, we've got a, a, a good surprise coming to us tonight from Brother James. Uh, he's, yeah, Brother James Lee, give him a hand. He's going to be speaking tonight, and also he's starting a brand new Sunday school class this Sunday upstairs in the far, far class. So they, him and... Uh, his wife's been up here working hard this week, getting that class ready, and so I've been real excited for them as well. Uh, but we're going to take up the offering at this time. If our brethren would come, we are, uh, ask you to give. Tonight is for missions, all proceeds and money that comes in on Wednesday night. Every bit of it goes to missions in some sort. And uh, we've been helping several different areas in mission. And uh, so I know Pastor has uh, been talking with someone else, and we're trying to help Africa with the um, children's home, the orphanage. So uh, that's going to be a fundraiser coming up real soon to help with that also. Uh, so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer um, at this time. I'm going to ask Brother uh, Charles Halls if he would lead us in this prayer tonight over the offering. if he were to come right now are you ready I'm serious now I, I've said this when I've taught class a long time and I know years ago I said this I wish he'd come today and I had a lady say no James I got loved one that ain't saved I said well ma'am you can say that a hundred years from now and I fully believe that Pastor Rodney the Bible says in Matthew 24, 42, does anybody know what it says in 44? Anybody quote that? Shame on you. But it said, be you or ye ready. For in such an hour you think not 
the Son of Man is going to come. And He'll snatch us all out, those of us that are ready. And I pray each one of us are ready tonight because there'll be that. that I talked to a man at the Corey Seas the other day. He was behind me in line checking out. And he said he got talking to his pastor. I don't know who his pastor. He didn't say what church it was. But he said to Pastor Edmund, are you ready? He says, well, yeah, but I'm going to catch the second boot. And I turned around and said, sir, I didn't know his name. I've seen him many times. I said, there will be no second boot. You either make it on that first load, and there won't be a second load. And he stopped and thought about it for a minute. And that's the truth, people. If you're not ready, I don't care who you are or where you are, when that trumpet sounds, I've always said for many a year, Lord, please don't let me miss that trumpet sound. I'm not perfect, and nobody out here is. But when that trumpet sounds, if you ain't ready, guess what? You're going to be left behind. And I don't want that. Uh, you've heard my topic that I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm not used to the microphone now. I don't used to, usually I don't usually have that. But anyhow, uh, I know, I know. I'm trying to find where I'm supposed to be the first time. And uh, there is a couple of scriptures pertaining to this. We've heard this word mentioned many times over the last few weeks. And part of it was tonight on singing and, and uh, worship. How many of you really worship the Lord? I'm t now look, everything I say tonight on my notes, I'm all over my own toes. And I believe what somebody said they had on sandals and I said it wouldn't hurt her too bad, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, worship. What is worship? Somebody describe worship to me right quick. Someone tell me what worship is. Amen. Amen. Loving God. Loving God. He loved us enough, didn't he? To go to Calvary. I'm gonna read a couple of scriptures pertaining to worship to get started tonight. Uh and 1 Chronicles 16, 29, and 30, it says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him, worship the Lord in the beauty of what? Holiness. And also in Psalms, even the David Psalms said in Psalm 6, it says on this, 95, 6, O come, let us worship and what? Bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our America. Now, I know there's people that's especially like Brother Leon there that can't bow down or can't because of physical handicap. And there's a lot of people like that. But if you're able to bow down and praise the Lord, I'll have something to say about that later on, do it. So we said, first of all, what is the word of worship? Now, Webster defines this as a feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. To show honor and respect with the love for God. First, one must have a desire to worship. I don't care who you are, how many preachers you are, if they don't have a desire in, in here. You can think about it all you want to. I want to worship the Lord. But if you don't think about it in your heart... It's not going to work, Brother Rodney. Uh, you must plan to worship. Think about that. I don't care if it's even in here during the, during the morning service. You, as you're sitting there thinking and hearing these songs, and I know Sharon, she was trying her best son to get people to praise the Lord, and I just, I mean, that's great, and we should do that even, even through song. But worship is both an attitude and an act. Two things. You first must desire to worship, but if that desire does not put itself into motion, your desire fell out the door. So when you say, I want to worship the Lord, I'm, I plan on coming to worship the Lord, don't just do it out of a habit. No, that's not what God wants. He wants it from the heart, as, as I was praying. He said, uh, you've got to act on it. 
You've got to do something. See, we've got to do something. God created us to what? Worship Him. Okay, now, you may have heard the expression, he or she worships the ground somebody walks on. Have you not? Am I, have I only heard that? Now, I love my wife. So I believe it was jury after Sunday morning, what does love mean? I said, and I hollered out, Lois. <laughs> <Why lie? laughs> but it's true, but I love her. I don't worship her. I don't worship the ground she walks on. In fact, I walk on the same ground she does. But worship and love go together and God. God will, he's a jealous God. Do you know that? And he loves for us to worship him. Now, there is also a false worship. You know, it says there's a true God. But there's also a false God, which old Lucifer is trying to take, take care of that. So not all worship is true in heart and in soul and mind. The attitude, here's the antidote that Jesus uh, commanded or commanded in his discourse with the Samaritan woman remains the best preventative against false worship. It's found in John 4th chapter 23 through 24 that all true worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. That's the antidote for any false worship out there. Um, in other words, that is, true worship takes place where? On the inside. On the inside. In the heart or spirit of the worshiper. See, we have a spirit. God gave us that when we were born. Um, worship that is pleasing to God must be what? Genuine, real, sincere, and offered with a humble heart. When we home by ourselves now at this altar, that's showing humility. If you're able, I'm just saying this physical handicap will not allow some people to do that. But when you humble yourself before him, that's showing humility. This worship is in truth should connect the heart or the spirit of worship with the truth about God and who he is and is also revealed in the redemptive plan in the person of Jesus Christ. How many of you have read the book of uh, Isaiah? I'm going to hit a lot of things tonight about Isaiah. Because I can't imagine. I've often many times said this in my prayer of the morning. God, I'd love, and I probably couldn't take it either, to be in that position when he saw God on the throne. But listen, when Isaiah in his spiritual eyes saw God on the throne, God was showing him the importance of worship. You need to go back and read this book if you haven't. First of all, Isaiah had to be cleansed by fire. I'll say something about that in a minute. That's when the seraphim, you know what seraphim is? Anybody ever read about seraphims or cherubs? A seraphim was a six-winged creature that God created. I've seen pictures of people that, you know, of in, in, envision what it looked like. He had six wings. Two of them, he, he uh, covered his body. Two of them, he covered his face. And two of them, he flew with. Now, why do you think he covered his face? You remember when Moses on Mount Sinai was in the presence of God in the burning bush? Moses could not look upon God. In fact, the word says, if anybody looks upon God, he will what? Die. That's why Moses put that veil over his face. When he walked down, his face was so shiny by being in the presence of God that the people probably couldn't accept that. Of course, there's another reason probably I feel like. When that your kind of glory left him, he probably didn't want his people to see that. But these cherubs, this seraphim flew, uh, uh, flew down. And, well, I said he had he had six wings, and he touched it with that with a coal. He took a, a coal or tongue. Now look, here's something else too that a lot of people don't realize. This was in heaven. Do you do you realize there's two tabernacles? 
There was a tabernacle in heaven. Where do you think Moses got the idea to build a tabernacle on earth? From the original plan in heaven. So God's on his throne. And, and I guess what Paul said, I went up to, I won't go to the third heaven where God is. Anyhow, this seraphim took this hot coal and touched the lips of Isaiah, and then his iniquity or sin was taken away, removed. Remember, since the cross of Jesus and the veil torn, the throne of grace is never empty. It's still there. And I'll say something else about something else that in a few minutes. In Hebrews 4, 16, we are told to come what? Boldly to the throne of grace. I don't care what you've done. It's over with. If it's sin and you've been forgiven, you have a right to come to the throne of grace now, boldly. This means we can come to God with confidence and assurance that God will receive us in Christ. It don't always have to be in church. Thank God for that. We don't always have to worship here on an altar in church. It could be, I've worshiped in my automobile. That's dangerous. Because <laughs> I remember years ago, I might have told this to some people years ago. I remember driving, I went to Field Chris, I drove 301 for about 20 some years. And I was going through Floyd's at that time, you only had one stoplight. <laughs> Thank God. And I was just praising the Lord. And all of a sudden, I found myself on the other side of Four Oaks and don't know how I got through Four Oaks, except by the grace of God pulling me through. So that's dangerous. If you worship, try to, try to pick a place that's been driving on an automobile <laughs> because it might be. It could be detrimental for you there. Now, uh, how many of you, I don't need no show of hands, but how many of you have a place at home where you worship? Think about that. We all need a place that we can go to God. He says, if you will go to me in the privacy of your closet, that can be a building. i got a large building out there. And nobody in there but me and the Lord. And I can say what I want to and leave my wife in the house. She's up now walking the hall. That she's in there doing while I'm out there doing it. And, uh, but we all need a place that we can find and we can get along with God and tell him what we want and just praise him. Now, Hebrews eleven six says this. He rewards those who diligently seek him. So if you don't seek him and you don't get rewards, whose fault is it? It's yours, isn't it? So worship is therefore in awareness and awesomeness of God's presence. Is that song we just sung a while ago? Presence of God. One of the first things Isaiah saw was that of God's mighty and awesome presence. As I say a while ago, I can't imagine, Brother Rodney, in my spiritual part, looking up and seeing God on the throne with his robe, filling that temple. And all those seraphims flying around. And I'll mention it again in a minute. I can't imagine that, brother. I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. I can't imagine he didn't, in his word, and he may have, he didn't fall on his face like John the Revelator did when that angel came down. The first thing he did was fall on his face. And the angel said, no, 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 get up. Don't worship me. Worship God. But I can't imagine what it would be like. Imagine this. What would you think you would do if you saw God on the throne? Whew. Wow. Anyway, and his sovereignty. God, as we all should know, is the three things we've all learned about. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. And he's omnipresent. What does omnipresent mean? Everywhere at the same time. Now, can you explain that to me? No, nobody else can. The wind is out there. We can't see it, but we can see the effects of it. So God is, you know, I used to think years ago, being in a Pentecostal realm before I became a Christian, I said, I heard them up here or places praising the Lord and talking and all, all kinds of, I thought, gibberish, and I've joined that rank now, but I said, how in the world can God hear all of that? I mean, I, you know, I can't understand. Maybe one I'm up there talking. But then I thought about it. Years later, I thought about this. What if 
a million people around the world hollered out, God forgive me. Don't you think God heard that? So don't put limits on what God can and cannot hear. And don't mind somebody beside of you praising the Lord. Hey, he hears everything. Those are, in his vision, that Isaiah was ushered into the presence of God. Then he began to worship. The word tells us in Hebrews 10, 25, not to forsake. Am I doing this right here? Or is it? Uh, to the assembling of ourselves together, especially in the house of God. Now, there is a scripture that says judgment is going to work. begin where? It's in found 1 Peter 4, 17. It says judgment is going to begin in the house of God. And it says there, if righteous people are scarcely saved, where do you think the ungodly is? Yeah, I'm giving y'all some food for thought tonight. Think about this. There is something about us that pleases God when we are in one accord. It wasn't enough room, wasn't it? And worshiping collectively as a body of believers. We are believers, aren't we? Everybody believes in God. I want to show up hands. How many believe in God? All right. Next time the pastor says, raise your hand and worship God, everybody here should ought to do that because you, you just showed me you can raise your hand. <laughs> In fact, you need to raise both of them. And, don't, and sometimes, most times, people do it, you know. And sometimes I'm like, but don't do half mad. Go all the way. Raise both hands. Praise the Lord. Okay, we are, uh, so worship really doesn't begin until we get into the presence of God or at least are made aware of his presence. Now, you know, you see, we can never hide from God, no way. I don't care where you go, if what you do. Before I got saved, I was going to Savannah Hill about, what, five miles down the road, and I was smoking. And I'd take my cigarettes out, and I'd put them over the sun visor. Boy, who was I fooling? You can't get rid of that smoke, that smell on your body. You can't do it. And I thought it was, you know, letting the people, you know, they don't want to see me smoking. They're who I had to worry about. I won't fool nobody but myself, really. Even David the psalmist said, he said, if I go to the heights of heaven, or if I go to the depths of hell, I cannot escape God. For he is there. He will be with us through hard times and through good times. Not only praise him in the good times, but praise him in the tough times. Well, look, as I've told many people, this is the best that we as Christians, I mean, this is the worst that we as Christians will ever experience. But it's the best that the sinner will ever have. You understand what I'm saying? We may be going through some rough times, but that's going to end at the rapture. Isn't that right, Brother Leon? We're ready for the rapture, aren't we? Amen. But for the sinner, it's going to be over with. Over with. Now, so, uh, plus, by God's all-knowing, he reads the sincerity of our thoughts. Do you realize it says in Matthew 12, 26, that every idle word will be accounted for? So whatever you're thinking about me right now, be careful. <laughs> so it might be writing down in, in the book of life up there. I just said that jokingly. But seriously, be careful how you think about somebody especially that you don't like or don't know. Look, God loves that drink in the ditch just as much as he loves me. He, don't, he may not like what they do, but he loves them because he gave his only son. And in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, Whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So is he. So if you think you're, you're really good, you're not really good. The Bible says there is none good. No, not even one. Listen, our singing, our praising, and praying are all part of our worship. But worship really begins when we become aware of his presence. I've got some more to say on this. As in the tabernacle, the altar of incense represented the praises and the prayers offered up to God. 
So we, through this same spirit, can begin to worship God. Worship him before the throne or mercy seat where the blood of Jesus was offered. Now, before Christ came, they had to do animal sacrifice. Turtle does lambs, whatever it was. Some blood had to be applied, but it had to happen what? Every year, every so often. Uh, I want, if you get, if you get, how many brought your Bible tonight? I want you to turn to turn to Hebrews, right, if you can. I'll wait for you. Uh, Hebrews, the ninth chapter. A lot of people don't realize this about the blood of Jesus, and I, I can't explain it other than what the Bible says, so I'll let the word teach itself on that but in hebrew the ninth chapter i love you about got it that wants it dirty has got bibles hebrew the ninth chapter reading verses 11 12 and 24 says but christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. In verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Think about this now. That's why I said there's another tabernacle. He went to a place not made with hands of man, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for who? For us. Praise God for that, Sister Linda. Mm. Woo! Hallelujah. Now you see, his blood has never dried up. Think about it a minute. The blood on Calvary dropped and hit the ground. How he took it to heaven, nobody knows. But I fully believe to this day that I'm standing here that mercy seat, if you look at it, what it's designed, there's a, little, there's a little crevice around it that would hold, say, liquid. And I got a feeling that blood, he went up there, and when he said right here, he poured it on the mercy seat. It's never dried up, Brother Rodney. For every sinner that cries out, that blood's applied to it right then. Never dried up, never dried up. And it still saves the sinner. It still heals the sick. That's why it was shed for us. Do you believe this? Thank you. Jesus, therefore, through his own pure sacrifice, has opened the new and living way into the holy of holiest. In the Old Testament times, only the high priest could enter the holiest of all. This perfect 15-foot cube. See, the tabernacle was actually 30 foot, 30 foot long inside the courtyard which was 150 foot by 75 foot. But you go into holy, you go into the holy place for the uh, showbread and all that wall, but then when the holy of holies was 15 foot square. 15 high, wide, deep. In Revelation it says heaven is what? 1,500 miles square. High, it says the breadth, the height, and the width are the same. I didn't say this. The book of God, the, the, the Word said that. Now, uh, so after he had cleaned himself and offered the blood of an animal, this priest, for the sins of the people, as when he had offered his own self. You see how blessed we are, folks? I don't have a lamb. I don't even shoot turtle doves anymore because I don't eat them. So I don't have a bird I can pour the blood out. Jesus did that for us. So aren't we, really, aren't we really blessed to be able to praise God and thank Him? Just nothing else. We're just saving me, saving us. Hallelujah. Now, uh, and we don't need a priest or a pastor to cry out to God. We can come, as I said earlier, the Word said, come boldly before the throne. You can kneel down anywhere you want to, and God will hear you. Thank God you don't have to be put on hold. Not pure hate that. You got you call somewhere. Let me. You go one, two, three, four. Here's your options you got to have. And then when you get there, well, we, we're not here today. Call back tomorrow. Well, thank God we don't have to worry about that when we cry out to Jesus. He hears us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> mm. So then, 
the blood of Jesus makes it possible for us to commune. And when we're communing with God, we're really worshiping Him. With God and He with us. This Jesus then is the only, this, this is the only individual that has been given the title of prophet, priest, and king, except Samuel in the Old Testament. He was a prophet, priest, and king. But nobody else except those two in the whole Bible. Not that I know of. If you found it out, let me know because I'll, I'll stand corrected on that. Now, so he is our high priest who now sits at the right hand of, of his own father making intercession for us. As we pray here on Monday nights, and I encourage anybody that don't come on Monday night to come out here. We intercede for the needs of this people, this church, and the people, and for people around here. All we can do is intercede. God has to intervene. I can't make the Leon shoulder any better than it is, but God can. We offer up prayers to him or anybody, and it's up to God to do that. But he wants us to do that first. And I know many, many times I've been, I say criticized, I don't say criticized, but, well, you need to go to the doctor with that. Well, I've had a knee problem for some time, but it's getting better. <laughs> I'm stubborn. I like to go to God first. And I know the people out there that, that has good hospital. I don't, I'm not above that. I've been in hospital. I've had two or three surgeries myself. But I still like to go to God first and say, God, you're my creator. You created me. Would you help me take care of this situation? And I'll praise you right now for it. Don't wait. Don't wait. Now, so, uh, so we can say that communion with God is the very essence of worship. As I mentioned earlier, only the high priest before the time of Christ could enter into that holy place. But now the veil has been lifted, and therefore all with clean and sincere hearts, with our sins forgiven, praise God, can look into this once sealed and clothed veil, seeing him on the throne, who sits there in heavenly places with his son on his right hand. Praise God. He's there interceding for me, Rodney. When I make a mistake, and they know I was perfect, he's there interceding for me. Sister Brenda Gale, she don't like called Ben. I call her Brenda Gale. <laughs> so, of course, Jesus has always existed. I'm going to say something here you probably haven't heard before. You see, when Jesus first uh, when he just before he went to the cross, he said in John 17, 5, listen to this carefully, folks. He said, and now, O Father, see, whatever I say, I'm going to back it up with the word. He said, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before what? Before the world was. That means he always existed, brother and sisters. Praise God. The Trinity has always existed. Of course, some churches don't teach the Trinity. That's their problem, not mine. I believe in the, all three, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They, still, they existed always, and they will always exist. Now, Revelation 13, 8 says this, that the Lamb was slain from where? The foundation of the world. And it says all will worship at one time or another. The Bible says in one place, every knee should bow. But in another place, it comes back with a clarifying statement, every knee will bow or shall bow. So wouldn't it be better for us to bow down now when we have an opportunity rather than being forced to? It will happen on that. You see, it was decided before the world was ever created that in the heaven is Jesus' death on the cross was foretold. You might say, brothers and sisters, there was a council meeting in the heaven is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they decided that a man called Jesus was going to have to leave that place and come to this world and die. Now, I've got another thing I'd love to teach some, some way called the analogy of Jesus and the wedding of a Jewish, Jewish bride. But anyhow, uh, so Isaiah was caught up into this in his glory. 
we too can now enter into this atmosphere. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that your body is the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The very breath, and I like that song we sing. We sing and it can't mean. We breathe came from God through Adam. Think about that. When God breathed into the nostrils of, Mo, of, of Adam, he became a living what? Soul. And, a, you know, the soul never dies here right now. So Adam, when he died, like most funerals, you know, a uh, preacher, whoever, in the word, thus thou art, thus thou shalt be. But where is the soul at? It's gone back to heaven. To who, when he gave to. I've heard a lot of people saying, they, you know, well, he died and gone on to heaven. No, he hasn't. The soul has, yeah. And one day that soul and body will reunite on that. Would that bring up another question about two other people, which I ain't going to bring up now. <laughs> but listen, the Bible also says, Fear him who is able to destroy the body, both body and soul in hell. Now, that fear don't mean <laughs> scared to death. It means have reverence to him because he does have the final say-so. We don't. We, and I trust and pray that I'm ready to go, and I thank God I am. But now, uh, And there again, I mentioned about nobody going into heaven. The Bible plainly says in John 3.13, no one, no one has entered into heaven except he who came out of heaven. Of course, you know, Lucifer, he, he's still kind of uh, ple uh, pleading his case for us. But nobody's going there but him. But anyhow, uh, Pastor Rick has made it so convenient. And I want to say this about that. I appreciate him doing this. It's front of a Sunday morning. He offers it for people that has need to be prayed for, and that's good. But if you just want to worship the Lord and lift your hand, and I know all of you can, now you don't say that, say that. If you want to come up here and pray and praise the Lord and worship Him, you see, a lot of people don't want nobody to come behind them and and lay hands on them if they just want to praise the Lord. Well, that's what He set this aside for. On this side and that side, if you want to come up and just worship the Lord, hands lifted up, kneeling down, whatever you want, I need to do more of it myself. That's, he's made it so available for that. So there's no excuses, and don't be ashamed to come to the altar. Well, so and so will see me going up there. Who cares? Amen. This place is a place, I think I got it in my notes somewhere, You've heard it before. We have come into his house and we've gathered in his name to do what? To worship him. And the song said that. And we sing it. And we act good about it. The words we sing, but do we do it in our own spirit and, and show forth that to God? We need to do more of that. Now, I remember years ago, Brother Thomas's Sister, Connie Johnson, you'd sing a song at the Gospel Tabernacle that Jesus is still the answer. That song has been with me for all these years. I still say it every now and then. Jesus is still the answer, Brother Thomas. She sung it with a convicting heart. It has never left my mind, and I pray it never will. He is still, and he, he was, and he is still the answer. So in us... And through us, God can and will manifest His glory and presence if we, what? Choose to worship Him with a true and sincere heart. He will never force you to do anything against your will. I know they've said, what in the world is a Pentecostal free will Baptist doing with a church title? Because free will is still a free will. He has never and never will take that away from us. We either do it on our own volition or we don't do it. It's up to us. I mean, he will not make you. He will not force you, Debbie, to praise him. Now, he, he created beings to do that. Of course, a third of them fell down with Lucifer. He pulled him out, showing you the power that he had.
But our church services should be the place and means of the manifestation of God's presence. Amen? Now, y'all said amen. You know what amen means? So be it. So you've agreed to that, right? We agree when we say amen. It should be that his presence is here. In Ephesians 2.22, it quote, and I quote, All of us as the building of God are fitly framed together and unto a holy temple in the Lord and built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Therefore, when we gather together to worship God, we create a habitation of God and the means whereby He can manifest Himself in us. There's something about when we worship collectively that said God is in this place. One person is good. Two persons is good. Could you imagine, Brother Rodney, if all of y'all and other half of the congregation Sunday morning would come in those doors just praising the Lord, singing, you know, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and the preachers, well, hmm, well, I'm going to preach today or not. It don't matter. If that many people would come in, all of you, praising the Lord, what in the world do you think would happen? I can't even imagine what would happen. Lord have mercy. If they've been over to Africa and watch it, people I've heard say they travel for miles just to worship the Lord. Rodney probably seen it when they went over to him and uh, he and the pastor. Now, so, uh, therefore, when we, got there, when we gather together, we cure to have now the difference in the habitation and the visit. I could go visit uh, uh, somebody. I'll just use Rodney. I'd go visit him. I won't stay there long. I'll leave. But now if I were to stay overnight, he might have to take me out and feed me. And I, I eat an awful lot, so it takes a lot to keep me going. But now when, when you have a habitation of God, he don't require you to, you know, have food. He, he just wants your soul. He wants your worship. He wants to build a habitation in you. And he, that's why Pastor Rick had been praying and encouraging us. And I've started more of it myself. Even the night before, Saturday night before you come into this church, pray for him. Pray that the Holy Spirit will be so real we can feel it when we come in here. And you'll know God's in this place. So, uh, it's not, I'll make a few couple of statements here. It's not necessarily the beautiful sanctuaries. And I've seen a bunch of beautiful sanctuaries just visiting various places. Or buildings, or a wonderful choir, or even our good fellowship of which all is well and good that should draw people to God's house as much as does the manifestation of God's Spirit. Think about what I just said. We have beautiful choirs singing. Wonderful. Wonderful building. My whole 5,000 people. But if God's presence is not in there, you might well stay at home. Now you think I'm saying this position? I am not. God inhabits the praises of his people, and he wants people to praise him. Not only at home, but in here, in this church also, in this building also. Uh, so when people are saved, healed, delivered, his presence is there. And it's, have you ever felt the presence of God? Well, oh, it's wonderful, isn't it? I might add here, God is also, I'm making that, yeah, I won't say this, it just comes to my mind. Have you ever did you know God carries a good fragrance? What's that scripture that says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good? Well, I was sitting in my barn probably a couple of years ago. I got a little lamb sure out there. Brother Rodney, I was sitting there praying and just minding my own business between me and God. And all of a sudden, I smelled something. And I looked around. I didn't have no spray in there. I didn't know what it was. But it smelled good. I said, Lord, is that you? And all of a sudden, it come by me again. People, I have never smelt and fragrance. I could almost eat it in my life. So I know God's real. Of course, I knew that by other ways. But when I, was, when I smelt that fragrance, I said, oh, God. Oh, God. Do it again. Do it again. 
He smells so good. He smells so good. So God isn't just over here you know, in, the, in the ashes. He got a beautiful fragrance about him. Uh, so a beautiful building. I'm going to make this statement. Without God's presence, listen, only becomes a shrine. And worship without him only becomes a formality. Does this make sense? You either worship him or you don't. We come in to give him reverence. We do that with the whole heart. When we leave our services, we ought to say that God was in this place and I met him. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Going home, just can't hardly stand to get back the next weekend. Not only did Isaiah see God on the throne, but and also angelic beings that say crying, Holy, holy, holy. And they didn't keep it to themselves. They cried out loud. They, in fact, they were crying one another, you see it in Scripture in Isaiah, to one another. So worship is therefore a humbling experience before God. We might as human beings often boast of our works or good deeds and our giving unto his cause. But the very moment we come into his presence, we are all humbled. And of our righteousness does what? Becomes as filthy rags. The rich, the poor are all equal at the foot of the cross. There's no big eyes or little use. No. To spiritually, uh, to spiritually view him in his glory, all of our past, thank God, is forgotten and we see him for who he is, the almighty, the all-sufficient one, the all-sufficient one, and the great, as he told Moses, I am. I am back then. I am today. In English, that's present tense, isn't it? When he went to school. And he said, I'll be I am tomorrow. God always was. He always is, and he always will be. So worship him for that. Now, we all need cleansing as was done to Isaiah. Maybe we too sometime uh, need to have our tongue touched by the fire of the Holy Spirit so that we might speak the things of God instead of the things of men. Maybe we need also to have our speech cleansed by glorifying God instead of speaking critically of others. Like I told you, I'm speaking to myself, folks, on this. When we say things about other people, do you think that pleases God? No. And who's going to account for that? We are. We are. So there should always be a cleansing in worship that renews us in the Lord. Brother Ron, this should be like a refueling station. Coming up Sunday after Sunday or Wednesday night, Getting closer and closer to God. Learning about Him through our Sunday school and through morning worship. This is where we get plugged back into that power. You have uh, any kind of uh, electrical outlet or uh, device, and when you, when you unplug it, your power's gone. We need to stay plugged into that power of the Holy Spirit. And we will never leave the presence of God the same when we're first Entering into it. Therefore, in closing, I've I done pretty good. Uh, we all need more than just a visit from God. We, all of us, we need a habitation. We need God to enter into us and stay with us. And, never, and he said he'd never leave us, but we need to make, be aware of that on that. Uh, so, born-again believers, and I pray everybody in here is, uh, should aim for the goal of becoming a reflection of God's holy nature through genuine reverence, worship, and obedience. Because he said, obedience is better than what? Sacrifice. We can lay all the lambs and all the goats we want to up here on this altar. But until we do what Paul told in Romans, the 12th chapter, I believe, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, brethren, to present your bodies, what? A living sacrifice. When you pray, say, Lord, I'm going to give you my body. I'm living. I ain't dead. The dead don't do nothing. They're dead. But I beseech you to give your bodies a, a present. Give them to God as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him, which is what? Our reasonable service. It should be automatic that when we became a Christian, we give ourselves to him. So, blessed 
And Ephesians 1 through 6, 1 through 3, I'll read this. Yeah, I'll just couple that out of the Bible. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly place in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in in love, having predestined us to adoption as his sons and daughters by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Man, that's, that speaks a lot, don't it? Now, grace and mercy are two different things. Although they work the same, grace really is God giving to people what they do not deserve. See, I didn't deserve heaven. I don't deserve heaven. But by his grace, he's given me that, and I didn't deserve it. But mercy is God holding back from us what we really deserve. When a person goes up to the judge in a courtroom situation and pleads mercy for giving a speeding ticket and he frees him from it, he was still guilty. So God's mercy just is held back and he gives us grace. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, I thank you for the night. I thank you, Lord, that you give me a, a word, and I pray that little people will take it to heart that when we come to church, this is a place we need to worship you. And I hope and pray that in the minds of these people, they're, they're going to go home and start searching out the word worship, what it means to you, Father. We're all bound to worship you one way or the other. I'd rather do it now. So, Father, bless these people and bless this church, and may it grow, Lord Jesus, that you will be glorified and exemplified. Forgive us of our faults, which are many. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we might do or even think about doing. And, Father, I thank you for the opportunity to speak before this crowd tonight. Amen. And, uh, Rodney, also, before you leave tonight, these, he's lucky. All four of, them, all four of these uh, blankets or sh- sh- uh, prayer shawls, right? Okay, prayer blankets. He wants us to anoint them. I don't know where to be going to. Uh, I, somebody else decides that. I don't know. Brother Mike. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Brother Mike Koala. I can't, I can't spell that late. I pronounce it too. And her, and, and her mother, Mike and uh, Linda, they still need our prayers because they're still trying to recover. So, and, and Kim, she, this is her last week of radiation. So please remember her. And anybody else, Kay, I know, and Leon, Leon has, he's having surgery next Thursday. He goes in Wednesday for pre-op, and I understand that's what she told me, that he's going to have a rod from his shoulder down to his elbow. So please remember him in, in your prayers, and anybody else that has a need, uh, uh, you're welcome to come up, but we want to, if anybody wants to come up and help in a circle around, and, and we'll pray over these uh, prayer shawls here. And thank-